Hello everyone and welcome to the HR Summit meeting. My name is Jan and I'll be moderating today's call. Our speaker today is Jonathan Mays, Esquire, Senior Vice President, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Albertsons Companies, presenting eight forms of bias and how to combat them. We'll turn to the presentation in just a moment, but first I want to go over the web conference instructions. Everyone is currently in mute so that the background noise does not become distracting for the other participants. To view today's presentation as the screens change live, you may go to the link that was sent to you in your reminder email. Once there, you may click anywhere on the page and you'll see a pop-up that allows you to make a comment. Feel free to ask a question by posting it as a comment and we'll make sure all of them are answered. For the newer participants in the group, it might be helpful to review some of the main benefits you can take advantage of as a, as a member at no additional charge. First are the live monthly web conference meetings, which you've already dialed into today. I hope you find these useful and we have an excellent lineup, which you can see by going to our website schedule page. Second, we do record all of these, so if you're traveling or stuck in another meeting, simply log in at your leisure and the full archives of past meetings are available to you with a number of interesting topics. Third, get to know the other members. By logging in, you can see all of their profiles and we're glad to make any introductions if wished. Fourth, if you're wrestling with any key issues or, or decisions, we strongly encourage you to reach out to the other members, and our site makes it very easy to post questions. The seniority and experience of your fellow members make this the best possible forum to get advice from others who've probably dealt with the same issues and can give you sound advice on what worked and what did not. Fifth, we really encourage site visits. If you've not visited others' offices to have a great discussion on best practices and see their facilities, please do so. You can log in to see the other members' companies and cities, so feel free to reach out, or again, we're happy to make introductions. Sixth, we also generate executive summaries of meetings, including the key takeaways and learning nuggets, so that you can reference them and put them right into action. Seventh, our members are very busy, so we started a service where we pick out the top six most interesting articles among thousands at hundreds of sites to keep you abreast and ensure you don't miss the key ones. Lastly is our book of the month summary that you can either read or listen to as you commute. Each month we'll be selecting the most interesting book, then summarizing the ideas so within minutes you can absorb the key takeaways. There are many other benefits of course, but I just wanted to highlight some and keep a lookout in your inbox for a number of these each month. That takes care of the housekeeping items. Give me just a moment to pull up the speaker's presentation and introduce him. <coughs> okay, all set. Now before I turn the call over, I'd like to tell you a bit about our speaker today. Jonathan Mays is Senior Vice President, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for grocery and pharmacy store chain Albertsons Companies. He's a certified diversity executive and a frequent presenter at conferences and universities across the U.S. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree with, uh, from Warner Pacific College in Portland, Oregon, and a, jury, a Juris Doctorate degree from Wilmette University College of Law in Salem, Oregon. Uh, he began his legal career in the San Francisco area and later joined Safeway, where he held a number of leadership positions in government relations, public affairs, sustainability, philanthropy, and diversity and inclusion. He's also a professional musician, arranger, and band leader. He's a vocalist and plays piano, guitar, bass, violin, and drums. He also is an athlete who's participated in Ironman triathlons, ultramarathons, and nearly 80 marathons. Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us today. Just say next when you want the slides to advance, and the floor is all yours. Yeah, thanks for that kind introduction. Welcome, everyone. I want to begin by making two quick statements. The first is, I hope that you and your loved ones are as well as you can possibly be during these really unprecedented times that we find ourselves in. Second is, my deep desire is that the comments I share with you today are helpful to you professionally and otherwise. Next slide. I live in this city. Many of you will recognize it. It's San Francisco. I live in one of the large, uh, tall buildings off to the left. I want to tell you a true story as I begin my comments. I'm active in my community, in my condo development, and on the Yahoo chat group and so forth. And last year, one of the comments was from one of my neighbors 
here, and there are hundreds of people who lived in the building. Before, actually, it's a four flex of tall buildings. And the note was, in order to build more community, it would be great if we had a ping pong table here. Don't you think we should get one? Different people weighed in, the pros and cons. The person who posted that note is a person whose name is Vincent. And I don't know nearly everyone here, but the only Vincent I know is a guy I used to swim laps with before the gyms were closed at least once, sometimes twice a week. And the Vincent I know, next slide, Next slide. The next, uh, Vincent I know is this person. Vincent I know uses that wheelchair that's in the foreground. He's paralyzed from the waist down. And so when, and I didn't know his last name, and, and so when this, this conversation by email was going around and it came from Vincent, I just didn't assume at all that it was this Vincent. Well, guess what? I was wrong. It was absolutely this mentioned. And I, I, I felt embarrassed. I mean, I've spoken a lot of, of, about bias and, and the unconscious bias that folks deal with and ways to lessen the impact. And I was embarrassed. And so I, I went to, to Vincent, and I told him what happened, and I apologized to him, and I said, I want to better understand people who are challenged physically. And he said, why don't you come over to my condo later this week, and we shared some Gatorade, and we talked. But my point then is, is that I... Even as a certified diversity executive, regardless of your, your, your credentials, bias is hard. And so what I want to talk about today, next slide, is the reality that bias is hard. I want to give some tools to try to lessen the impact of bias. And I, these are things I'm using myself, I, and I, I've shared with many others since the, I've learned this lesson. The bias is hard because it's all based, frankly, on the, on the way that the, 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 the mind works and, and, and neuroscience. The, as many of you know, the human mind, at any split second, can take in 11 million pieces of information. Think about that. Any split second. But at a conscious level, you're typically only aware of about 40 pieces of information. So what that means is your mind is making conclusions, snap judgments about things. Oftentimes, well, nearly all the time, the reasons that at a conscious level you're not even aware of. That's where bias lives. Next slide. That's where bias lives because we literally, and sometimes not even at a conscious level, when we look at a situation or we're looking at a group of individuals, we, we, we give them a thumbs up, nearly, unconsciously, or sometimes a thumbs down. It's unconscious, as the slide says, because it's unknown, it's unspoken. We don't even necessarily even know that we have these things or why we have these things. And the bias is a tendency to act in a certain way. Again, thumbs up or thumbs down. But again, you as an individual may not even, as I said, be aware of why it is you feel the way you, you feel about a certain person. Next slide. And I think you all know that a lot of research has been done over the years about the business case for diversity and inclusion the business case for eliminating bias in the workplace. And just to take McKinsey as an example, they've done two studies that are massive, one involving 1,000 companies, another involving 500 companies, and others have done research as well. And I think you all know that the conclusion is that companies that do a good job of embracing diversity and inclusion, having an inclusive workforce, they tend to outperform companies that don't. I think we all know that. A lot of research has been done on this. Next slide. So again, 
again, that, that brings me to, to our goal. I think we, as professionals, all want our companies, our organizations, to be as effective as they possibly can be. We know that one of the ways that we can be effective is to embrace diversity and inclusion, to have welcoming environments for our workers. That's the goal. We also know the reality of bias. And so let's talk about some of the common types of bias and then ways to lessen the impact. Next slide. These are eight of the common types, and kind of at a high level, I'm going to go through them and I'll give examples about them. And then, as I said at the end, I'll give you some tips, some recommendations, some tools for lessening the impact of bias. Let's go to the first one. Next slide. In group bias, it's the tendency to give preferential treatment to those who people perceive to be members of their own groups. I'll say it again. The tendency to give preferential treatment to those whom people perceive the members of their own groups. It's also known as the just like me bias. We tend to prefer people who we perceive to be like ourselves. Next slide. How does that work? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. Most of you have heard, or many of you have heard of what's called the Rooney Rule. The Rooney Rule, named after an owner of a professional football team years ago, who in 2003 was looking at the number of African-Americans who played in the NFL, and then the number of African-Americans who were head coaches at that time, again, 2003. In 2003, you want to guess how many African-American head coaches there were in the league? Well, the answer is three. There's three. And the owners, the owners said, we need to do a better job. These numbers do not represent, frankly, the, the percent of African-Americans who are, who are players. We need to increase this. We need to get delivered about it. And so that's where the Rooney Rule was born. And so the idea behind the Rooney Rule is for every head coaching position in the NFL, at least one of the finalists for that role will be an African-American candidate or a person of color, right? That was 2003. Fast forward to 2020. Do you know how many African-American head coaches there are in the NFL? Would you be surprised if I told you that the answer is three? Exactly the same number as it was in 2003. Now, again, bear in mind that some people, some coaches have obviously left and others have come, but in terms of making progress, we're exactly where we were 17 years ago despite this rule. One of the persons who lost out, he was a finalist, he was an African American, who lost out on a head coaching role, went to the owner after he had heard the decision, and the African American candidate said, Hey, tell me, you pick Joe rather than me, and you tell me why. And in a moment of amazing transparency and candor, the other said, Well, I just felt more comfortable around Joe than I did around you. Bear in mind, the African-American who had asked this question had been on teams that had won more games. The African-American had more experience than Joe, had a high, higher winning percentage than Joe. But the answer was, I felt more comfortable. I think you know that that happens with NFL head coaching jobs, that is with bias, that is in-group or just like me. But unfortunately, I think we all know it happens in the workplace all too often. The decisions made about who we are going to hire, who we are going to develop, who we are, and who we are going to promote. Next slide. Confirmation bias. Boy, with COVID-19 and different state responses, and the whole notion of 
do we keep people sheltered in place, or do we put people back to work right away? It doesn't really matter where you are in that spectrum, because intelligent people can disagree. Here's how confirmation bias works. You're searching for, you're interpreting, you're emphasizing, you're recalling in that information in a way that confirms one preconceived notion. That's a mouthful. I'm going to read this again. The confirmation bias is where a person is searching for, or they are interpreting, or emphasizing, or recalling information in a way that confirms one's preconceived notion. Let me explain. Next slide. Think about, if you watch TV, where you tend to gravitate for your news, or even online sources that you look to. I have friends who are those who swear by, I almost swear by Fox News. They wouldn't think to ever go to MSNBC for their news. I also have friends who are in love almost with MSNBC. They get 90, if not 100% of their news from there. They wouldn't think in a heartbeat to go to Fox News because Fox News is not there, it's not honest in their mind. CNN, people feel strongly about that. Next slide. Here's how we digest information, though, sometimes, many of us. We're looking for, as it says, 11 facts that support all your opinions. It's the same way with regard, again, to how we make decisions in the workplace sometimes, like who we hire. And we have these notions, many of us, about people. And so we look at this candidate, or we look at this employee, and, and we look for confirmations about them in our minds, even though frankly what our, what our beliefs are are not always fair. I'm here to tell you, sometimes Fox News gets it right, sometimes it gets it wrong. I'm going to tell you that MSNBC, sometimes they get it right, sometimes they it's not 100%. It's in much the same way with our emotions about the biases that, that crop up. Well, sometimes we're confirming things and we're valid, but sometimes we're making conclusions. We're looking to confirm a conclusion that we have about a person when it's not valid. And that's how it works. That's how it works in terms of decisions made about who we hire, who we promote, who we develop. Next slide. Halo corn effect. This is related to the second point I just mentioned. This is where you are allowing the person's positive or negative traits to still open from one personality area to another. In one's perception of them. I'm going to read it again and then I'll explain. It's allowing a person's positive or negative traits to spill over from one personality area to another in one's perception of them. Next slide. This is a terrific example of what I'm talking about in the next slide. We all know who this is. I mean, at one point, he was called America's favorite dad. When we started hearing stories about him drugging women and assaulting them, actually, a lot of us who kind of have grown up following Bill Cosby, we didn't want to delete not Bill Cosby, no, not lovable Mr. or Dr. Huxtable on the Cosby show, no. And so there was so many people like Halo over him, and we didn't want to believe what was what I believe to be true. Again, in the workplace, there are perceptions that we have about some people. And, and maybe, like there's mentioned on that, there's a, there's a fair amount. And so I tend to gravitate towards runners. And so I hear something about them that they're killing, well, no, they're a good runner. Or Mr. Keaton, I think that's a great guy, it can't be true. And so we put a halo over them when really they should have horns. And so as we think about who we hire, 
only get to look at who we promote. And we kind of step back and we think, who is that person really? Irrespective of what our perceptions might be, whether it's a halo or a horn, who are they really? And focus on those with the eyes wide open to treat everyone objectively like they would like to be treated and not to get hung up too far and to drive into a belief that may not have the same value about who that person is and that person's, ab that person's abilities. Next slide. Stereotyping. I think this is one that we all know about. Associating group membership with different traits and abilities. They're a member of a group so you think you know them. Next slide. This is another picture of the town where I live, the area where I live, San Francisco. I want to tell you a story. I was on my way home from work one day, and I have an unusual way of commuting. So I'm, I, I ride a skateboard. I ride a skateboard to the subway, you know, run on the subway and take it to my destination. And then once I get there, I've got my skateboard and I go to my office. It's just a great way, I think, a fun way to be able to commute. So I was on my way home, and I decided to come a different way than when I was in the city. And I went into the sales office for the first time, see in the middle, this tall building, this beautiful building. It has condos, and it's, it's really brand new. And so I went into the sales office, put the skateboard under my arm, walked in, and the lady behind the counter, and this is a pretty, as you can imagine, pretty fancy, pretty hoity-toity kind of place. You know, wood paddle walls and hardwood floors and expensive art on the wall for this sales office. But I And this woman looked at me, uh, who was behind the counter, who was working there, of course, looked at me, and she said, uh, can I help you? And right then and there, I thought, wow. That, that's not a very welcome meeting. Yeah, I'm going to come on and take this one to your mind. You're on this one to And so I, I said, yes, I'm, I, I'm here for information about your comments. And she looked at me and she said, well, if you want information, you have to have an appointment. And our appointments are 45 minutes long. Would you like an appointment? And I thought, this woman is not busy. I don't understand why she can't answer my question now. But I'll go with it. And so she said, I get to take your information. And so I'm thinking, this is a pretty fancy place. And so she's going to have an iPad. Or she's going to have some you know, nice thick bronze paper with kind of a gold inlay around it or something. Do you know what she gave me? She gave me a little post it, kind of two inch by two inch post it note for me to write my information. I'm thinking, wow, really? But I'm going with it. And so I write my name and my phone number down and she and I gave it to her. And she said, we'll be in touch. And I turned around and just as I did, and I was getting ready to walk out, there were three other guys, they looked like they were kind of, at least one of them was working there, they were, you know, nicely dressed guys. And one of them said, as I was getting ready to walk out the door, he said, what, you just walking by? Just like that. I thought, wow, that's, that's, a, that's not very welcoming, that's, what's that all about? And so I thought, well, what should I say? How should I respond? And so I turned around and I looked at him and I said, well, actually, I own a one-bedroom condo at the Metropolitan, which is really across the street from this building. I said, in addition, my wife and I own a two-bedroom condo where we live at the Infinity. That's about two blocks away. Which, which she knew. I said, so obviously I know the neighborhood. I've watched this building go up from the ground up. And I really just came by to ask a couple of questions about the condos. 
and her drawers just dropped. And I turned around and I walked out the door. I got back on my skateboard, heading for home. And I've got to tell you, I felt really bad. I felt, why is it that they're treating me this way? They can't possibly treat everyone this way. Yes. So they're not going to sell very many condoms. Yes. And so I, so I was just skating home. And then my phone, then my phone rang. And it was the lady at the condo place. And she said, Mr. Mays, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to respond to your questions while you were here. Are there any questions I can respond to now? And I thought, wow. And she couldn't have answered my questions when I was there. But she didn't because she had stereotyped me, an African American guy walking in, and there was no way in the world I could possibly buy one of those condos. That's how stereotyping works. That's how it feels. And... Again, we see this in the workplace all the time with how different people perceive different candidates or different employees on the staff who are really qualified to do things but don't get the chance to show it. Next slide. Availability bias is where we make a decision based on the most accessible information rather than on more objective evidence. Let me read it again. Making a decision based on the most accessible information rather than on more objective evidence. Again, in the workplace, this is about who we hire, who we develop, who we promote. Maybe we're looking to hire someone and the last three candidates for that role, last three hires for that role, all kind of fit a certain profile. Maybe they happen to be all non-diverse men, for example. And so when the candidates come in and they're going to be interviewed, we look at the state and we see no people of color. We see no women. And, and so there might be a tendency to say, oh, well, gee, the reason we the recruiter might say we couldn't find this qualified folks who are women or people of color. And to that, I, I say, did you, how far did you look? How wide was the net that you cast? Next slide. Because I'm here to tell you that there are qualified women and men and people of color, people of different physical abilities, different sexual orientation, that are out there. We just need sometimes to be more persistent, more diligent and looking for them. And by doing that, by getting more diversity in the workforce, it helps the companies be the very best that it can be. As I mentioned earlier, as evidenced by research that has been done by McKenzie and others. We just need to pause and look a little bit longer and harder. Now, I want to say, you really, I mean when I talk about diversity. When I talk about diversity, it's not two things. First of all, it is not about displacing anyone currently in their role. If you happen to be a white male and you're in this role and you're doing a good job, I say good on you, keep it up. Nor is this about hiring or promoting people who are not qualified to role or are likely to succeed. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm really clear about that. What I am talking about is as positions become available, I think we just need to be a little bit more diligent often in terms of how we go about filling those roles and, and how we go about filling those slates. And I mentioned the Rooney Rule in one diverse candidate. Research shows if there are four candidates and only one of them happens to be a woman, the chances of that woman will get the role, all things being equal. All things being equal, nearly zero. What needs to happen with the Rooney Rule is it needs to be modified. So there needs to be at least two, needs to be at least two diverse candidates. And I would say the same with regard to your, your interview candidates as well. But you look to get at least a couple. Because if it's one and you have a total of four, chances are you're not going to get the diversity you seek. Next slide. Recency effect. Ignoring outcomes at the beginning or middle of a sequence 
and instead focusing on the most recent memories that are easiest to recall. I'm going to read this again just for clarity. Ignoring outcomes at the beginning or middle of a sequence and instead focusing on the most recent memories that are easiest to recall. Next slide. We all know of the tragic deaths in a helicopter, in a helicopter of Kobe Bryant and eight others who died that day crashing into the mountain in Southern California. It's just horrific, beyond belief, almost. It's so tragic. I have a friend who's a commercial helicopter pilot and he's flying people for a living. And I asked him right after that accident how he was doing. And obviously he was very concerned about it. But his business, as you can imagine, hit the floor. Cancellations are coming left and right. But the reality is that helicopters have been safely flying for decades. And this unfortunate incident, and very unfortunate, is real. But when you look at the overall history of helicopter flights, chances are if you go up, you're going to come down safely. No doubt about it. It's much the same way, next slide, with how we view employees at times. We make decisions sometimes based on what they are doing right now, this week or last week, in terms of their performance at work. We shouldn't be looking back and looking at all available information about that person, how he or she has performed during their time at your company. You all know it's possible that some life event that's temporary, frankly, could be occurring for that person that's impacting their ability to do their job well. Maybe there's a sick parent, sick parent, they're caring for at home, or a sick child or something. They need to leave work earlier. They need to take more time off. And my point in all this is we need to look at the big picture, not just the immediate last week or the last two weeks in terms of the overall performance. Well, we just we have to happen recently. Look at the big picture and the performance, and that is a better way to evaluate the strengths of that particular candidate or the strengths of that particular employee. Next slide. Loss aversion. It's the tendency to prefer avoiding losses by maintaining the status quo than by acquiring equivalent gains. Let me read that again. It's the tendency to prefer avoiding losses by maintaining the status quo. And let's go to the next slide. An example of that is if the last three people for a role all fit a certain demographic, if you will, there's a tendency sometimes to think, well, the last three people we had in that role were fill in the blank, so let's, uh, next person we hire should be just like them. There's that mindset. Sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's not. The last, I work in retail. You know, the store directors typically are male, and so there's a tendency, in my industry, in the supermarket industry, there's been a tendency to kind of go with what has been in the air culture successful in the past. But, so the willingness to sometimes take a chance is not as strong as it should be. But in order to get the positive change, we need to do something different than we've done in the past. And so what I'm saying here is sometimes doing something that's a little different, that is the change, is what you want. You want the change, you want the change to outcomes, but that also sometimes is what you get a chance on certain candidates. And I think we need to be more willing to do that as HR professionals from time to time. Next slide. The last slide I'm going to mention here is the bandwagon effect. I think you all have experienced this, perhaps, in means. It's the tendency to do or believe things because many other people do, often due to a desire for harmony or conformity in a group. I do believe that in a multitude of counsel, there typically is wisdom. I do believe that. But I also believe sometimes, you know, we've been in meetings, as I've said, where you kind of, kind of go along, even though you don't truly agree that it's the right approach. Because you don't want to rock the boat. Next by talks about this. You've been in meetings like this, perhaps, where someone is the person in charge and he or she is making 
became a recommendation. And in your mind, and probably in the mind of others around the table, they're saying, what? Hey, it ain't so. You've got to be kidding. Punish the thought. Heaven forbid. No, no, a thousand times no. And that's what people may be thinking. And then it's time to go to measure whether there's a consensus. All in favor, you can say, I, I, I. My point is, I, I want to encourage each of us, and this is me too, to have the willingness, the courage, if you believe it, to say, you know, I see your point, but would you consider an alternative approach? One of the benefits of diversity and inclusion is when you have a diverse group, people are more willing, if they come from diverse backgrounds, to maybe go in a different direction, we have a different perspective, to not just go along to go along sometimes. And you get richer conclusions that way. But again, I'm recommending that it takes the courage to do that. And oftentimes we don't see that in meetings. And so it's the bandwagon effect. Now let's play this person. When in your mind you're thinking, boy, it really should be a different candidate. That's a diverse candidate. Next slide. So there are more extra bias in my list here, but these are the eight that I want to talk about. I also want to give credit to an organization called the Gartner Group that helped me put this presentation together, and so they've listed these eight, but again, there are many, many more. So as I said, these are the eight common types. What can we do about it? That's what I want to turn our attention to now. What can we do? Next slide. There's a great book I just read recently called Best Self, Being the Best You Can Possibly Be. Now, I want to look at that second word there, self. Now, I want to make an acronym from it. One, I hope, is easy for, to, easy for you to remember and to apply. Use the self acronym to minimize the impact of a bias that we can so easily fall prey to the decisions that we make. Next slide. So, again, self. Here's what self stands for. Next slide. S in self. Stands for slow down. By that I mean, when you are looking to make decisions about who you are going to hire, who you are going to develop on your team, or who someone who is your colleague will develop, or who you're going to promote, or who's going to be in the succession plan, and who you're going to exclude from that succession plan, I want to encourage each of us to slow down. And to pause long enough to ask yourself objectively as best you can, why am I picking this person as opposed to that person? Is it possible that I'm falling victim, if you will, to a bandwagon type of bias or a stereotype or an angry bias or any of the other types or any of the other types of bias? Is that possible? And be honest. You ask yourself, should I go in a different direction? But this really only happens when you slow down. So that's in self, slow down. Next slide. S, slow down. E, and for empathy. Put yourself as best you can in the shoes of the candidate who's sitting across from you. Horrible. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who's working in your company who really wants to move up but hasn't been allowed to. But you believe has the potential to. Put yourself in the position of someone who is not in a succession plan but probably should be considered to be in one. Put yourself in their shoes. How would you like to be treated if you were in their shoes? I'm sure you would like to be treated fairly. Well, so would they. And so, and so as you think about your work with your colleagues, I want you to encourage people you work with in your organizations to slow down when they make these hiring decisions, development positions, succession planning, promotion decisions. Slow down. And you empathize. Are there things that you're missing by not kind of putting yourself in the 
for short. E stands for empathy. Yeah. Next slide. S stands for never stop learning. That is really more about groups, different from the one you are in, ethnically, demographically. The example I mentioned earlier of my son Denson, when I had made a mistake and I had fallen prey to the preconceived notion, aka of bias, that the person in a wheelchair would not be interested in playing ping pong, never stopped learning. What I did was, as I mentioned, I went to him and I said, I'm sorry, can you school me? What's it like? Be curious. Seek to learn about groups that are different from your own. Encourage people in your organization to do the same. Particularly if, and if they're honest, they may have some bias against that group, or at least maybe a lack of a, of a warm embrace, metaphorically speaking, of that group, be it transgender, be it LGBTQ, be it a different ethnicity, fill a different gender, fill in the blank. You never stop learning. Be curious to learn. This is a third trip you can take to recognize the impact of bias that you might have. Next slide. And related to that, again, is to be curious about other cultures as part of your learning process. Cultures different from your own. By doing so, you will have, frankly, a broadened perspective that will help you make the best decisions for your company in terms of who to hire and who to develop and who to promote. Never stop learning. Oh, thanks for learning. Next slide. F. F stands for find examples. I'm confident that if you are intentional about it, you can find great examples of people who are fill in the blank, Hispanic, who are amazing and talented folks or African American or fill in the blank. They are out there. And sometimes we just need to take the time to look. They're there. For every group, every group, there are examples who are ex of, of folks who are exempted. But also the examples of people, frankly, who don't represent the group very well at all. So if you, again, have bias towards a group, five examples, not only learn about them, but just to find them. That stands for find. Find these great examples. They absolutely exist. Next slide. So self. We've talked about different types of bias with no good tool. This tool is developed by a group called Hudson out of Australia. And that's a great tool. This great acronym is one I think that's very portable. That is, you can easily take it with you. You can easily remember it, I hope, and apply it. S standing, again, for slowing down. E stands for showing empathy for a different group. All stands for learning. Be a constant learner about groups that are different from yourself. And S stands for finding positive examples, positive role models, if you will, positive representatives, if you will, for, for groups, particularly groups that you may tend, if you're honest, to have a little bit of bias towards. Next slide. By doing this, by bringing in different groups into your organization, by welcoming, welcoming them, I believe you will have a stronger team. Not only do I believe this, again, research shows your company will tend to perform better by getting different voices in the room, in the conversation. And by doing that, I believe your company will help, you can help your company be the very best it can possibly be. So I hope that the discussion this morning has been helpful to you I hope that these tools that I've gone through are applicable readily for you. And I want to take time now to respond to any questions individuals may have. 
Thank you, Jonathan. We really enjoyed your presentation. Before I go out and check the chat, <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. And before I um, present the questions that were submitted, do we have any live questions? Again, it's star six to unmute your line and go ahead with your questions. Or you can click anywhere on this last slide and enter your question as a comment. So again, any live questions? Okay, Jonathan, we've received several questions throughout your presentation. Keep in mind that you may have touched on these topics, but I'm going to ask all the questions anyway in case there's something you'd like to add or elaborate on. The first question that came in, uh, let's see. By increasing diverse candidates from one to two in a field of four, you're increasing the percentage who are diverse. Is that what increases the chance of hiring a diverse candidate, or is that hiring more affected by the, a reduced bias reflected in the candidate pool composition? Well, I think it's a combination of things. First, the statistics show that if you have a candidate pool of four, talking about maybe the four finalists, and two of them are diverse, women or people of color, that there is a higher percentage chance that the, a diverse candidate will get the role. There's no doubt about that. Likewise, if you have a diverse interview panel, it's less likely that you, excuse me, it's more likely that you will have a diverse candidate who is selected for the role, who's offered the position. And so I think it, I think it can be addressed really both ways in terms of the composition of the panel that's doing the interviewing and making the decisions, and then the, the panel of candidates to come in. I think both are in, both will help enhance the chances for hiring the first candidate. Okay, thank you for that. The next question that came in is, how do you apply this in an environment that works without these sensibilities? I think you begin with the business case. And I didn't touch on it very much, but there is a lot of information out there around the business case. When I launched diversity and inclusion at my company, we're a big company, we have about 270,000 employees across 35 states. When I launched it, I launched it from the very beginning with the notion of the business case is as follows. We all want our companies to be the best they can possibly be. I think we all would agree. We all would agree, therefore, that we should want to use every tool available to try to help our companies be the best we can possibly be. Assuming that they're legal, obviously, and ethical, obviously. But we should want to use every tool. I think everybody would agree with that. Because here's the fact. The fact is the companies that embrace diversity and inclusion Generally speaking, outperform those that do not. And you can look at McKinsey uh, articles on this and research on this, and uh, among other places. And it's, there's just no doubt about it. There's a penalty for companies that don't embrace diversity and inclusion. They, they're shown to underperform. They're more likely to underperform their competitors in their sector. And so it begins with the business case. So often with diversity in the past, there's been kind of this social effort. Uh, it's the right thing to do. Well, that's maybe reason 451 for, for doing it. It's the right thing to do. But there are 450 other reasons that are much more important. And so in terms of just, again, the, your company and kind of its culture, I, I, I think all the companies would agree with, with what I said earlier about the business case. And then it's a series of other companies being the best it can possibly be. And presumably they are. But you have to take steps to look to become more diverse and more inclusive in your workforce. But it begins with the business case. Okay, thank you for that. The third and fourth questions, and those are, these are the final two, are somewhat related, but they're not the same. I'll give them both to you at once, and you can separate them and answer them separately, or you can just deal with the topic in general if you'd prefer. The third one was, you talked about encompassing the individual's past year's experience when considering performance. And this, this came in during the part about recent, recency bias. 
Um, are you doing yes. that, are you doing that at your store level, and how do you ensure consistency throughout? The second question was, how are you weaving many of these practices throughout your stores? Yes. So, we could do, and I think most companies could do a better job of this, but it's for the role of the manager, a good manager, should be able to have the mindset, the manager, the mindset of, well, this person used to be really punctual, Lately, they're not. Why? Well, this person's performance used to be at an A level. Now it's a C. Why? And so the role of it, I think the, the description of a good manager is to not just see the person come in and wait for a person who's now at a C or an A, but it's, it's, it's to try to understand the why, and it's to try to coach. But my, the reason why the recency bias is such an issue is all too often, I think, people just think, ah, they were an A, they're now a C. I'm done with them. They're, they're stacked down without taking into account the reality of life. And so what we're trying to do as a company, and we're not there yet, we're working on it, is to try to train our managers to try to better understand the why. I'm not talking about going into personal probing questions. That's, that's, that we obviously want to be really careful. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's, it's, to, it's to be able to have the curiosity and the interest to understand the, the why and what's going on. And we're going to see, well, can we shift the hours? I mean, I've managed a team. That's what I have done. Where you know, I needed to shift some of those hours to make it work better for them. Or it needed to, we're doing this now, people needed to work from home remotely more often than what they may have done in the past. But they were so just productive that they're working you know, different hours. Maybe they're working from 7 to 9 p.m. or more. You know? So that's what I'm talking about. In the stores, it's, it's the same way. What can we do to, to figure out how to help this person be the best they can possibly be? And, and obviously, there's some instances where the person was an A or C, and they're always going to be C after that. And I get that. But I'm suggesting there's some people who are A, have been an A, and are C, and would help to get back to an A. We just need to take that step. And so that's what we're trying to train our people to do. Okay, thank you very much. And we've covered everyone's questions. Do you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom you'd like to share before we end the summit today? Well, one of the points I talked about when I talked about self is learning. And so I want to say I appreciate the fact that you are taking the time today because you wanted to learn hopefully more about this important topic of diversity and inclusion. And I, I commend you on that. Um, I've, I've, I've been in this for years, and I'm still learning, still working at it. And I, I want to encourage each of you to continue to do that so that ultimately you can be the very best leader that you can possibly be. And so I just I just commend you for your interest in, in the discussion today. And I'm passionate about diversity and inclusion, as I hope you can tell. I hope that you are as well, or if you're not, that you will become, because we all know that this country is becoming more diverse. We're going to be majority minority by 2040, 2045. I know that's off in the future, but it's every day we're getting there. And so if our company is to be the best that they can possibly be, we need to be embracing diversity and inclusion all the more. And so thank you for being part of our conversation today as we talked about ways to embrace it. Wonderful thoughts, Jonathan. And, th and on behalf of the executives on the line, I'd like to thank you for sharing such powerful ideas and key thoughts with us today. Your involvement and dedication to our profession sets a high benchmark for others to follow. For all of the participants on today's call, thank you for your continued membership and insightful questions for today's speaker. The meeting's now officially concluded. Jonathan, thank you again so much, and everyone have a great day. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.